Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 24th to 30th of May, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. Before getting into this week's news, a special shout out to our good friends at Spacewatch.Global and Go Taikonauts, two excellent sources of space industry news. This week, we bring you some additional updates on the Zhurong Mars rover. We bring you a recap of a pretty interesting China space industry webinar from earlier this week. But first, a review of the launch yesterday of the Long March 7 and the Tianzhou 2 cargo vessel to the Chinese space station. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. So this week we saw the successful launch of the Tianzhou 2 cargo spacecraft from Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on Hainan Island in southern China on board a Long March 7 rocket. The Tianzhou 2 mission is the first cargo mission to be sent to the recently launched Tianhe core module of the Chinese space station and will be followed next month by the launch of the Shenzhou 12 crewed mission, which will carry three Taikonauts to the now very well stocked space station. As of several hours ago on the 30th of May today, we received news that the Tianzhou 2 cargo vessel had successfully docked with the Tianhe core module, and uh, again, it is now a well-stocked core module. So just a couple of points to unpack about the rocket and the cargo vessel, and then I will turn it over to Jean for a bit more of a technical overview. Um, so first point, this was the first launch of the standard Long March 7 since April of 2017, when we saw the Tianzhou 1 cargo vessel sent to the since deorbited Tiangong 2 space station. Since then, we've seen a couple of attempts of the Long March 7A variant, which is a variant that aims for geostationary transfer orbit, one of which was unsuccessful, one of which was successful. So again, we've gone about four years since seeing the Long March 7 original variant launched. Uh, we also did hear from uh, from Xu Lijie, the chief designer of the Long March 7, a couple of weeks ago in an interview at Wanchang, uh, that there have been a number of improvements made to this Long March 7 compared to the previous version. And this included higher precision of the launch window due to having a better understanding of the complexities of synchronizing the launch with the position of the space station uh, at, at the point of launch. Um, Regarding the Tianzhou cargo vessel, this is the second time that China has launched its new generation Tianzhou autonomous cargo vessel. The vessel has a liftoff mass of around 13 tons, and around half of that weight would be used for cargo, and the other half being the actual vessel itself. And I can only hope that some of that 6,500 kilograms of space included some Laogan Ma, hope for the Taikonauts, that is. I don't know how you'd be spending time in space as a Chinese person without Laogan Ma, or as a Western person at that. If I ever go, I, I'd, I'd bring some with me as well. Um, one last thing that stuck out about this mission, and it's a point that we've discussed before with launches at Wanchang, is the apparent pilgrimage of a lot of space fans from uh, from different parts of China going to Wanchang for the launch. And so as you may recall, in the uh, cup, about a month ago, the launch of the Tianhe mission from Wanchang, we saw the, the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra playing on the beach with the Tianhe launching in the background. And again, this time we did see a lot of people in Wanchang. And in particular, there was an interesting video circulating around Twitter, whereby there was a news anchor that was interviewing a handful of young people after the launch. And the people, they were wearing these custom made shirts that said Zongguo Hangtian, so like China Aerospace. Uh, and they were, they were just really very clearly proud about having seen this Long March 7 uh, reach orbit. And impressively, one of the people mentioned that they had gone to Wanchang three times uh, because the first two launches were delayed. And um, basically the person, she, she literally said, uh, this is likely to be the event that leaves the biggest mark on my life or the uh, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Anyway, uh, last point is that the people that are being that were being interviewed in the aforementioned video, uh, they specifically mentioned they were university students who are graduating this coming year. And so again, it's just pretty cool to see young people who are coming into the workforce in China being very excited about space and apparently taking time off from university, I guess. Uh, perhaps not. Maybe the term is over. But uh, anyway, interesting, uh, interesting developments. And again, nice to see this pilgrimage of people heading down to uh, to Wanchang, contributing to the local economy in Hainan. That's always a good thing. And uh, just, you know, kind of getting the word out there about how interesting and inspiring a lot of these space programs actually are. So uh, um, really good stuff. Uh, Jean, how about your 
your takeaways from the Tianzhou launch? Well, I agree with you. It was very striking to see the uh, enthusiasm and the emotion on those uh, uh, space fans in, in Wenchang. I think at some point, uh, Dongfang Hour is going to have to go to Wenchang and join the locals and uh, watch how some of these launches uh, take place. But um, going back to, to Tianzhou, and I want to discuss some of the technical specifications. And so Tianzhou is about 10-ish meters long, which makes it fit snugly in the payload fairing of the Long March 7, which is 12.5 meters long. It is composed of a service module, which contains uh, many systems like the propulsion system, the electrical power systems, and also the communication systems. And it is also composed of an orbital module, which uh, contains the cargo. The orbital module has a diameter of 3.35 me meters, which fills as much as possible the payload fairing, which is slightly larger than that. While the service module, on the other hand, is smaller. It has a diameter of 2.8 uh, meters. And the idea behind that is that with a smaller diameter, you're able to fit a number of subsystems directly on the exterior of the service module, uh, which is not possible on the orbital module because it is too big. And then the systems would be, in that case, in contact with the payload fairing, which is no good. Um, so that's the first point. The second point I want to point out here is that there are some slight differences between the Tianzhou 1 that was launched in 2017 and the Tianzhou 2 that was launched, um, well, a couple of hours ago, basically. The first one is, firstly, I want to remind our listeners and viewers that Tianzhou is actually available. The orbital module is actually available in three different configurations. There's the initial configuration from 2017 for Tianzhou 1, which was the fully pressurized version which is uh, a configuration where when the uh, Tianzhou spacecraft docks with the Chinese space station, it is the Taikonauts that then basically you know, open the hatch and then they are in charge of transferring the cargo in, from the pressurized bay into uh, the Chinese space station. On the other hand, you have two other configurations, which are the semi-pressurized and the non-pressurized versions. And in this case, it's actually the robotic arm of the Chinese space station, which is in charge of moving the cargo around. And this is notably useful when you're trying to send big subsystems to the Chinese space station that don't necessarily fit inside the pressurized cargo bay. And then this is when you would go for the uh, semi-pressurized or the uh, fully non-pressurized version of, of Tianzhou. Another small and less visible difference of uh, Tianzhou 2 was this small circular interface that you see on the front of the orbital module, and that is actually for the robotic arm and effectors um, to attach to. And a good question now would be, you know, why on earth does Tianzhou need this attachment? Because Tianzhou is able to perform autonomous docking. It is equipped with radars, with laser sensors, and it has all it needs to just dock autonomously to the Chinese space station. And indeed, that is what it did a couple of hours ago with Tianzhou 2, and that's also what Tianzhou 1 did in 2017. And the answer actually to this um, circular interface for the robotic arm is to test the capability of the robotic arm to perform assisted docking for just spacecraft in general. And the idea behind that is that the larger experimental modules, Meng Tian and Wen Tian, which will join the Chinese space station um, next year, these actually will not be able to perform autonomous docking. And this is where uh, the robotic arm, I believe, will have a role to play in helping these experimental modules connect with the Tianhe core module. So back to Tianzhou 2 and how this will be tested. Um, Basically, Tianzhou 2 uh, will dock with the Chinese space station, the, the rear docking port of the Chinese space station. Actually, that happened a few hours ago. And um, following a visit and a departure of the Shenzhou 12 crewed spacecraft, uh, then Tianzhou 2 will then detach and dock this time to the front docking port of the Chinese space station and this in the actual direction. And finally, after the arrival of the crew of Shenzhou 13, Tianzhou 2 will then um, undock again, and this time it will be the robotic arm that will capture it and that will test um, this assisted docking maneuver. So it's really interesting to know that Tianzhou 2, while it is a cargo spacecraft and it does have the role uh, of bringing some cargo uh, to the Chinese space station, it also, I think, in the history of uh, of Tianzhou spacecraft and even for future Tianzhou spacecraft, I think it has this very unique role in uh, playing, uh, you know, a, a technology verification. Uh, role rather than just cargo resupply. So um, definitely an interesting mission for, for Tianzhou. We should give the robotic arm a name. <clears throat> I feel like we refer to the robotic arm often and it has a mind of its own, I feel like, just doing all these. Auto so yeah, we'll, we'll in a couple of weeks come back to us fans and we will uh, we'll see if we have a name for the robot. I mean, you know, a well, Canada arm has, has a name. That's a real thing. You know, we gotta, we'll give it some thought. <clears throat> 
anyway, uh, over to Zhu Rong then. We... Absolutely. So moving on to Mars, the world is in the throes of a Martian summer. We have no less than two rovers. We have a helicopter. We have multiple orbiters, all designed and built and launched by mankind that are currently traversing the red planet and its orbit. And while we may not have breaking news on Mars every week, this is clearly a very significant event for mankind. And given the role that China is playing in this current Martian summer at Dongfeng Hour, we plan to give you as many insights as possible every week on actually what is going on over there. And now that Zhurong has actually landed on Mars and that the Zhurong rover has successfully driven off the lander, we're really getting a lot of content currently uh, from the Chinese internet. And this week, Specifically, we want to share with you this piece of news or report that came from CCTV and that discussed notably the measures that were taken to make sure that Zhu Rong uh, drove off safely the ramp that led it from the lander platform to the Martian soil. And this is indeed a perilous maneuver uh, performed on a pair of skinny little ramps. And I'll put up the picture that we showed last week where you see these ramps taken from the hazard avoidance cameras and yeah, definitely looks kind of a tricky maneuver. And the dangerous uh, dangerous nature of this maneuver was actually confirmed by the amount of time it took Zhu Rong to perform this drive off. Uh, Zhu Rong landed on Mars on May the 14th, but the Zhu Rong rover only left the lander eight days later. That was on May the 22nd. And so during that time, during those eight days, there were a lot of verification tests that were going on during that period to make sure that nothing would go wrong when Zhu Rong would start the drive off. And so let's quickly recap some of the things that Zhurong did during this verification period. One of the first tasks of the rover was to image its surroundings with the two navigation cameras that were on the rover front mast. And the idea here was to get a good understanding of the surrounding environment before performing the drive off. And an important related point here is that the deployment rants of the lander are actually designed to be able to deploy in two opposite directions, according to the Tianwen-1 deputy head designer Zhang Yuhua. And that's why the cameras, uh, one of the reasons that the cameras played an important role, because the images captured by the cameras would then determine which is the more favorable direction uh, to deploy the rails. And so after the imaging performed by the camera comes step two, and this is the most interesting part. So 400 million kilometers away from Zhurong, in Beijing, the Tianwen-1 technical teams set up a replica of the Zhurong rover and lander in a simulated Martian environment, taking into account things like the inclination of the lander, the local topography, and even the position of various rocks and obstacles that were captured by the Zhurong navigation cameras. And the reproduction of the Martian environment actually went as far as taking into account the lower gravitational field that you have on Mars, which is roughly 3 8 what we have on Earth. And they did this by adding this sophisticated cable system that would be uh, connected to the top of, of the rover and which would continuously provide an upward force of about 5 eighths of Jurong's weight on Earth. They even pr placed also uh, in this simulated lab multiple light sources uh, that would simulate the exact amount of sunlight that the rover would be getting at the time and also simulating the, um, the inclination of the sun rays that the rover would be getting. So really cool stuff. And the angle of the rails in the end of the, of the ramp, sorry, from the lander were determined to be around 20 degrees. And the engineers then in Beijing did a lot of try and, and error attempts, uh, driving off the, 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 the replica of the rover and trying different speeds and trying different control parameters to make the, the rover drive off um, happen successfully. And after much trials, the Tianwen one technical team, they ended up getting what they considered to be satisfactory uh, performance for a safe drive off. And then these parameters were uh, then uploaded from the replica of the rover to the actual rover that's 400 million kilometers away so that the rep so that the real rover would be able to replicate the exact same descent. And the last fun fact here, which is a figure that I want to mention, is that the descent time, that well, the parameters that were selected uh, made the descent time last 425 seconds for ramps that look like what visually they look five to six meters long. So that's, that's literally, um, 0 0.05 kilometers per hour. I think that is, that is very, very slow. And that just shows that for that little small maneuver that looks like nothing, it's actually very sophisticated stuff. Space is hard. And this is why they would want to drive off so slowly. Indeed, 50 meters per hour. That is uh, that is impressive. And to think, you know, how long would it, it would take uh, 8 billion hours, I think, if it's to go 400 million kilometers from uh, from Mars back. Is that 
Is that eight billion? Twenty-four. Yeah. Be, no. Uh, yes. Eight billion. Eight billion hours to get from uh, if it were traveling. So that's um, um. So just a couple of of I guess last points more related to the um maybe the speed of the rover and and so there there was an article from the Scientific American that mentions that the the top speed may be as much as two hundred meters per hour. So about four times the uh, the speed that it would have descended uh, on those two uh, two ramps and um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think overall, it's uh, it, it's to John's point, space is very hard and very precise, and there's um, a lot of room for error. And so, I suppose maybe uh, maybe fifty meters per hour is is quite quite sufficient. But overall, um, certainly some uh, some interesting things happening on Mars now, and we are looking forward to uh, continuing to bring updates from the Red Planet over the course of these next several months. Uh, Jean, anything else from your side on, on the Mars uh, on the Mars situation, or shall we head into our last story of the week? I, I'm good. Okay, so this week uh, we had moderated by myself and a colleague a uh, a China commercial space industry webinar. It was hosted by Euroconsult, and uh, it was a doozy. We had five panelists, and it was about an hour and twenty minutes, and it was represented by a handful of the top commercial space companies. In China, uh, this included a pure play satellite manufacturer and ComSat, uh, two hybrid manufacturer operators with CGSTL and Spacity, a launch company with Galactic Energy, and a TTNC company, namely the amazingly named Satellite Herd, which is probably my favorite space industry company name of any company, the Satellite Herd, because, you know, why not? Um, Eventually, this this webinar will be posted online, so we will certainly be keeping you up to date on that when that occurs. But but just before that, uh, before we see that, just a short kind of overview of what did we learn from this webinar, what kind of takeaways uh, came out of this. So I think the the I'll give a brief overview of of kind of each company and their their main takeaways from the webinar. So the first one I'd like to highlight: uh, CGSTL, which is of course a leading Earth observation satellite manufacturer and operator. And we heard from the company's VP and chief engineer, Zhong Xing, that they now have around 500 employees at CGSTL, and around 80% of those employees have either a master's or PhD. And this would make CGSTL one of the larger commercial space companies in China, um, but that still makes them a drop in the proverbial bucket compared to some of the large state-owned enterprises. So for example, CASC has around 180,000 employees, and even the high-level CASC subsidiaries like CAST or, or, uh, or CALT, uh, they would have like 20,000 employees. So again, CGSTL, much smaller still with 500, but nonetheless fast-growing and, uh, and quite large by commercial space industry standards. Um, we also heard from CGSTL that their goal is to have 60 satellites in orbit by the end of 2021 or beginning of 2022. And as we reported a couple of months ago on the Dongfang Hour, uh, they were originally planning end of 2021. So this appears to be a little bit of a delay compared to this previous goal. And the also the the other slight delay that we heard was this idea that their 138 satellite constellation may not be deployed until the end of the decade. And again, a couple months ago, we heard end of the 14th five-year plan period. And it's not entirely clear what is causing the delay. However, one of the things that we've heard from some companies is it's, you know, launch cadence. There's just not enough launch. The, the satellite manufacturing element in China is already seemingly fairly well developed, and it's now a question of getting enough launch capacity. So interesting, uh, interesting takeaways. We'll see. Uh, on the topic of launch, we had Galactic Energy as well on the panel, and the company's representative, Claire Wu, reaffirmed their target date of 2023 for the inaugural launch of their Polis-1 rocket, uh, and they also discussed a little bit the successful launch of the Series 1 that occurred in November of last year. Um, and as one of the relatively younger Chinese commercial space startups, having been founded in early 2018, uh, Galactic Energy has progressed impressively quickly. They're now the second commercial Chinese, uh, sorry, second Chinese commercial launch company to have launched a rocket into orbit with their aforementioned Series 1. And also mentioned by Galactic Energy during the webinar was their international business partnership with Huatong, which we mentioned recently on the Dongfang Hour episode 33. So now to get into the two hybrid satellite manufacturer operators, Spacity and Comsat. Uh, so appropriately, Spacity was the only company whose participant was dialing in from outside of China. The CEO of Spacity Luxembourg, James Jung, dialed in from Montreal, which was apparently an indication of the company's quite international footprint, and discussed Spacity's role as, again, arguably the most international commercial space company in China. This despite having come from the relatively not-so-international city of Changsha in, in Hunan province. Uh, 
James Jung also mentioned that Space City has been aggressive in finding foreign partners, partially through its rapid launch cadence. So they launch a lot of satellites and they kind of sell the the idea of having a platform that if you want to test some technology, you can get a spot on that platform and they're going to orbit. So um, definitely some interesting takeaways from, from Space City. Uh, so the other manufacturer operator, Comsat, uh, reaffirmed their goal of completing the company's Tangshan satellite factory by mid-2021 with an eventual satellite capacity of 100 satellites per year. And the factory is billed as the first privately owned satellite mass production line in China that is approved by the NDRC, or the National Development and Reform Commission. The company's director of strategy, Dong Lu, noted that their value proposition is to have a fully turnkey service. So according to Dong, some companies would only want to buy satellites. Some companies want to have satellites plus some constellation planning service. Some companies might want satellite plus constellation plus application development. And so in short, Comset hopes to be this real one-stop shop for companies that are looking to procure satellites. Last company, and certainly the dark horse of this webinar, was Satellite Herd. They were the only company that's currently making money in the sense that they have a very different business model from the other four. Satellite Herd does not have huge R&D and CapEx for many years before any revenue. They are a TT&C company. And so this means that they have, and TT&C, for those who don't know, telemetry tracking and command. It is a service whereby they have different gateways around the world. And these gateways, which is a bunch of satellite dishes that are looking up at the sky, they would help either launch companies or satellite companies to track their rockets when they get launched or to track their satellites as they are in orbit to communicate with them, etc. And so again, Satellite Herd having built out already this global network of some few dozen ground stations, uh, they are now in revenue phase. I mean, they're kind of a relatively mature company. And so overall, pretty interesting webinar. Uh, one last point that I would uh, highlight, and I thought it was a very fun question to ask, is that one of the audience members asked, how do you guys work together? You know, explain what, what kind of cooperation do you have? And interestingly, there was a lot, lot of cooperation. Everyone buys TT&C services from Satellite Herd, and CGSTL buys some of their payloads from ComSat, and they buy some of their other equipment from Spacity, and they're all talking to Galactic Energy about launching on their rockets. So there's definitely... I mean, obviously there is competition and these companies are, are in many instances competing with one another, but there's also a lot of collaboration. And my feeling is that partly this is because of the, as we've discussed on previous episodes, that the very different worlds that commercial companies and state-owned companies live in, in the Chinese economy, in the sense that you have state-owned companies that are essentially like the house in casino terms, where they have this you know, they, they have a large advantage in many areas. And the commercial companies, they really need to kind of stick together to have a better chance of surviving, I think. And so again, a lot of uh, a lot of competition, but also a lot of cooperation, it seems like. So again, we will keep you up to date when that webinar gets posted in full. But uh, meantime, Sean, anything from your side of the EuroConsult webinar or any of the points that I just mentioned? So unfortunately, I did not have the time to watch the webinar. I can't really comment on it. But um by the sounds of what you're saying, it sounded like a very interesting uh, webinar. And I think that you also um, get the feel through this webinar and sort of expands on something that we discussed in a previous episode and how how there is all this interaction in a very dynamic Chinese commercial space sector between the various positions on the value chain. So um, uh, definitely we'll give it a look when when I have the time and when it's released. Um, and, and in the meantime, that that's all for me. Excellent. Well, we once again have about seven more pieces of news that we just cannot get to. And so this is the friendly reminder to check out our Dongfang Hour newsletter. If you have not done so already, there are definitely seven more stories this week. And uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, including, uh, you know, APT Mobile Satcom getting into the real estate business, among all these other things. So um, many thanks for your time. I'm Blaine Curcio, and uh, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. Thank you for watching. See you next week. Have a good day.